I like to think that 9th level spells, if given to a bunch of people, are enough to completely change a big capital city. A whole region, perhaps, if used correctly. Meteor Storm can destroy a whole city with no much resistance. Spells like True Polymorph can create dragons and great powerful fiends from the greatest champions. And the powerful Wish spell can fill in the blanks. But as powerful as the Wish spell is, it has limitations. Under Mountain is an example of the wonders that the Wish spell can accomplish, which is incredible, but not enough to truly change more than a big region. As impressive as Under Mountain is, it really is just located within a small fraction of a country. 10th level spells, on the other hand, if given to a bunch of people, is enough to change whole continents. Spells like Maven's Create Volcano had ranges of effect of about 20 to 30 miles. Even though the activity of the volcano would only be active for about a year, the change in landscape was permanent. Proctiv's Move Mountain had a similar level of grandiosity. It was like casting the counter of Move Earth, but with mountains. Spells like Maven's Earthfast could completely prevent any form of cave-ins within a range of 20 to 30 miles. A dedicated group of wizards casting this spell could easily create an Underdark for themselves. But then, what about 11th level spells? What power are we really talking about here? Well, unfortunately, we only have two spells ever made for 11th level. One of them is powerful enough to change the world. The other? The Solar System. Now, for me to be able to explain Proctiv's Breach Crystal Sphere, a level 11 spell, I actually need to drop in a fair amount of context. As an adventurer playing an adventurer like Storm King's Thunder, if you were to look up at night, you would see all the bright stars in the sky. Probably the most eye-catching thing would be the moon, which is called Saloon. The moon is particularly enthralling because following it are asteroids that are perpetually glistening like stars who forever tag along with the moon. These asteroids are called the Tears of Saloon. It would be very pretty, actually. An adventurer wouldn't be to blame to ask himself, has anyone ever made it up there? I mean, think about it. Wizards can teleport to any place they have either seen or been to, and even if they haven't, they can certainly still try. Has a wizard ever teleported to the moon? We have heard stories of brave adventurers basking in the pristine waters of Bytopia or challenging the might of the evil monsters of the Shadowfell, and, well, just recently, I hear there's a few that challenge the might of Avernus. But what about the stars? What exactly happens if I cast Fly on myself and just keep going up? Well, do know that what I'm about to tell you is literally canon. You can actually go to space. In fact, it is a lot easier than you think. In Dungeons and Dragons, gravity is an all or nothing power. A body of mass is either attracting you through gravity or it isn't, unlike in real life where it is more of a gradual thing. If you were to cast the fly spell and simply go up, eventually you would leave the atmosphere and you would notice that gravity will suddenly simply stop affecting you. You would start just floating in space. You as an individual will start producing your own form of gravity, albeit very small, though substantial enough to carry with you a small pocket of air around you. This pocket of air stolen from the planet will gravitate around you forever, or at least until you land somewhere with a bigger force of gravity that will then take the pocket away from you. That being said, breathing from said pocket will only sustain you for about two minutes until the air runs out of oxygen, leaving only carbon dioxide, which is, of course, quite poisonous to breathe. The size of the pocket of air differs depending on the size of the object living into space. The pocket would be fairly small if it is a human, but it would be quite big if it was a chunk of land. If you were to, for example, enchant your house with levitation and then go to space in that way, the pocket of air that would be created by your large home might actually be enough to sustain you for months. Space in Dungeons & Dragons also lacks the problems of pressure that real-life space possesses. For example, in real life, if you were to go to space without any spacesuit, because of the pressure, your lungs would collapse and break. The water in your body will start to vaporize, and your skin might swell enough to burst in different locations. This problem doesn't actually exist in Dungeons & Dragons. Space isn't quite a vacuum as much as it is simply just a lack of atmosphere. 
The coldness of space could be a problem in Dungeons and Dragons, but that depends entirely on the solar system that we're talking about. In the Forgotten Realms, for example, space is actually quite warm. But in other spaces, like in Greyhog, space can be very, very cold. For us, however, here in the Forgotten Realms, that's just not a problem that we have to contend with. Now, when you combine not having to worry about low pressure and space being quite warm, you end up with a formula that actually allows for a lot of easy exploration. In short, as long as you have air, you can travel in space without the need for a suit or anything fancy. Of course, the problem of distance still stands, as the distances between the planets is still quite large, just how it is in real life, so you probably won't get anywhere anytime soon on your own. I swear, I'm, I'm getting to the point, just give me a minute. To travel in space, people actually use spelljammers, which are ships propelled via magic. This is the only way to actually get anywhere in space at a reasonable amount of time. Now, the technology, of course, to create these ships and propel them is, is quite advanced. Not all races have managed to do that. The Netherese, however, did actually manage it and actually ended up exploring space quite a bit. Now, this is finally where the level 11 spell that they created will come into place. Actually, no, you, you need more context. See, this is what we call Realm Space. That's the name of the solar system where the Forgotten Realms is set. The planet where you all are is Toril, which is right here, the third planet. Now, we don't necessarily have to worry about the other planets in this video. Each of them have their own goings on and there's no time to really go into them. The important thing to know is that the solar system is encapsulated in a bubble. In fact, every single solar system is encapsulated in its own bubble. We call these crystal spheres. Now, these crystal spheres are extraordinarily important because they essentially denote the extent of the god's reach. Outside of the crystal sphere, your god will not reach you or be able to see you. Now, every Dungeons and Dragons world has its own crystal sphere. The world of Greyhawk has its own, the world of Dragonlands has its own, Eberron has its own, etc, etc. Inside of the crystal sphere, the planets work as you would expect, and space works the way that we just described it. But outside of the spheres, things are different. Outside of the spheres, all that exists is a dense gas called the phlogiston. It is believed that this gas is the very essence of creation. Now, the crystal spheres reside around this gas like marbles in water, sort of floating around in this gas, preventing any of it from getting in into the respective solar systems. Now, it doesn't matter what you do, what spell you use, how much you beg your dungeon master, the phlogiston will never be able to get inside of the crystal sphere. This is literally like the only rule that supersedes DMs in the entirety of Dungeons and Dragons. Not even gods can make that happen. That being said, the crystal sphere can be opened through small portals all around it. And using these portals and openings, people can actually leave their crystal sphere in order to traverse the phlogiston and find another crystal sphere to explore. And, phew, okay, now you finally have the necessary context. Here we go. Proctives Breach Crystal Sphere, level 11 spell, range of touch with a permanent duration. Area of effect is one crystal sphere with a casting time of one action. Quote, this spell allowed the caster to permanently close a crystal sphere to all traffic, though teleport spells would function. Casting this spell in its normal form supersedes any previous seal cast on it, and traffic through the sphere could once again be possible. Any sphere sealed by this spell before the fall of Netheril was closed and cannot be entered except through the use of teleport spells. The sealing of the sphere prevented spell jamming vessels from entering its space. Only through planar travel, teleportation magic, or other mystical means could one gain entry to a crystal sphere sealed by this spell. The material components for the spell was a 100 ton spell jammer vessel that contained a major helm, which was consumed at the utterance of the spell. End quote. Now, passing through a crystal sphere, as the spell suggested, could normally be done through a lot of different methods. The natural kind, which was to wait for a portal to open that would let you pass through. These portals actually appeared spontaneously and randomly all across the crystal sphere at different times. And that was essentially what this 11th level spell would prevent. It eliminated these portals from naturally opening. Now, you could still, however, simply dimension door through the crystal sphere or any other form of teleportation, but this, however, would severely limit, as you can imagine, the amount of travelers that could enter the solar system. Not just because 
it is hard to find people that can teleport, but because everyone travels using the spell gemming vessels and teleporting a whole vessel through the sphere, well, that's, that's a whole other thing. Now imagine me showing you this 11th level spell without actually explaining how space works in Dungeons and Dragons. That would have been a nightmare. But now that I did give you the context, I can actually go back and explain the 10th level spell that I missed from my last video. Valdex Sphere Cell. Level 10th spell with a range of touch and a permanent duration. The area of effect is a single watercraft with a casting time of 9 minutes. Quote, the archwizard Valdic loved to travel, not through the planes, but through the prime material plane. Travel between crystal spheres was his favorite, but he didn't like the amount of time required to traverse these long distances, therefore he created the sphere sail spell. Unlike spell jumping helms, which converted magical energy into motive force, the sphere cell gained its power from one of two sources, depending upon where it was being used. Within a crystal sphere, the spell dipped directly into the magical forces of the goddess Mistral and converted this raw power into motion, giving the spell gemming craft great movement. This allowed the user to go from one planet to another quickly, or from one city to another at lightning speed. Outside a crystal sphere, the sphere cell spell focused on the gravitational energies of the destination sphere, pulling itself along these lines, gaining speed. By using this spell, a spell jamming vessel could traverse the distance in half the time ordinary spell jamming crafts were able to move. Cast upon a vessel designed specifically for spell jamming or on any watercraft, the spell was permanent until dispelled by an arcanist of equal or greater level. The effects of the sphere cell could be turned off and activated at will as many times daily as needed." End quote. See, this spell was particularly good because a spell jammer used the magic of a wizard or cleric driver, but the speed of the ship would be of course tied to how good the wizard or the cleric was. This level 10 spell essentially allowed you to harness the raw magic of the goddess of magic in order to fuel the vessel, making it be almost twice as fast as any normal spell jammer without the need for an actual driver, which is huge. Now, if you guys are actually interested in hearing about spell jammers and space and, and the solar system and the phlogiston, then well, let me know, because that would have to be a whole other video. There's just so much to this that I cannot feasibly cover this here. Now, the last and the only level 11 spell ever designed was called Maven's World Weave. A range as far as you could see, a permanent duration, an area of effect of a mile per caster level, and a casting time of 10 minutes. Quote, the world weave allowed an arch wizard to change the weather patterns of a large parcel of land until dispelled. Throughout Netheril's existence, the spell was used hundreds of times to stay the effects of the polar ice in its northern borders. This gave Netheril's land a temperate climate instead of one more suited for its placement on the globe, a subarctic clime. When cast, the arch wizard was able to change the climate of an area by one grade, either up or down. It was possible to change the climate more than one step, but multiple layers of Maven's world weave were required." End quote. And here we have a graph showing us the grades. With the spell, you can make an area up to 30 miles in area become tropic, subtropic, temperate, or subarctic. This spell was insane, not just because of the extreme long area that it covered, but mostly because of its duration of permanent. A wizard could simply use this wherever he would go, changing the temperature and hence changing the land anywhere he would go. Forever. This spell was so powerful it could literally change an entire planet if simply used enough. It's maybe not as grandiose as blocking an entire solar system from spatial travel, but enough to be one of the strongest spells ever created. So now you see. 9th level spells are enough to change a city or region. 10th level spells are enough to change a whole continent, while 11th level spells can change planets. Now, if this is the case, what about 12th level spells? Well, only a single 12th level spell was ever made, and all it took was for it to be casted once for the gods to completely ban anything even remotely close. But we might talk about that in our next video. I would like to thank my Patreon supporters Rukato Fan, Daniel Luna, Dr. Cowbell, Skits Your Boy, Major Fail Gaming, Saleog, Barry Maskant, 5E Magic Shop, Dog Feeder, 
Daniel Umar, Morgan Johnson, Zach Bowell, Simon Holman, Rusty Rain, Biotechnofrag, Kush Bane, and Mediocre at best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please, please head on over to patreon.com slash MrRex to support. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for staying here, listening to me ramble about incredibly potent spells and about space. It took a while to go through that context, but trust me, it, it really was needed. Now, in the next video, we're going to talk about 12 level spells and maybe even talk about epic magic. We've mentioned it before on a previous video, but I, I really want to go as in-depth as I can here, uh, making a dedicated video just for this spell. So... Pay attention, make sure you're subscribed, and look forward to that video. I'll see you guys then. Bye-bye.